protected me in that way. And George, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, just tended to be just one or two beats below having the same a professional approach that Sean had and that Roger later had. I wouldn't say he was amateur, but he was certainly looked upon it more as a game than a serious profession, which indeed it is and always will be. I did my own stunts because I thought I had the illusion that every actor did their own stunts. I mean, I, I, I was disappointed that I wasn't allowed to ski. Uh, you know, I enjoyed skiing and I thought I could do some of it. The insurance company cut me out of that and I was upset. But Peter wanted to be able to get in close with the camera. It works better for stunts. And so I was an athletic kind of guy. I mean, it didn't bother me. I remember I pulled my shoulder out of joint doing one of the stunts. And Peter, you know, said, he's tough, he's a straight, and he can handle it, just keep going. You know, and I had to keep doing the same stunt over with my shoulder out. I don't think you could step into Connery's shoes. But I think he did a credible job as James Bond, and I think he would have gone on to have done more and, and was very, very good. Now, the reason I didn't do another Bond was, there's a, there's a lot more to it than this, but to cut it short is that I thought it was Connery's gig. I thought, I'm already famous. Why try and stay in something that I felt it was finished? I thought it was over. You know, once uh, Connery had finished it and the times were changing, I, the whole hippie thing had started. And here was this conservative character, detective. And I thought, well, to stay with this, I'm going to go down with a sinking ship. And I left. All of these things happened, but the main thing that happened with us was the technicians. The people that worked with us are the best part of this whole uh, campaign that we started. The boys that worked for us, from Ken Adam and, and uh, uh, Terence Young, and all of these people were phenomenal. They were so phenomenal that after we completed uh, Dr. No, and we went on to do uh, the other films, uh, Russia with Love, Goldfinger, they all hung about and stood with us because they enjoyed making them. You know, I stress the team element certainly about the, uh, these films, but uh, I mean, Terence was a director that set the sort of style of it. And uh, I mean, when I did the first Bond films, Terence really took me in hand and uh, sort of knocked me into shape with this tailor and, you know, and the Tumblr Nassau shirts and all the gear. And, uh, but what we did share and still share to this day is a very mutual uh, sense of humor about what we consider is kind of funny and what we think is style in a way. I don't know, we, we went into it uh, having no idea what the hell we were really uh, getting ourselves into. It was, it was a fun picture. I don't think I've ever made a film where I've had more giggles all day long on the picture because we didn't want to send it up. It had to be done straight, but with a slight tongue in cheek. I'd worked with Terence before in They Were Not Divided and played a Welsh tank driver and he wanted to be played Q as a Welshman. And I said, well, no, it wouldn't work. And he said, well, try it and um, I battled with him quite a long time and said and in the end I gave up and I said right you want it like this now here is the original suitcase from Russ with Love it's as you can see rather battered because it is um, nearly 30 years old well I said what do you want me to play it like this look this lovely briefcase I've got here I just press the button and out comes a knife. And he said, no, no, you're quite right. So I have played him as an English civil servant ever since. You see, we had very little money. Everybody forgets this. Dr. No was made for one million dollars. And when you think that the set of the volcano in uh, You Only Live Twice cost a million dollars, you can see how far, you know, we've come a long way, baby, you know. It was a gigantic set. And, uh... We used over 700 tons of structural steel to, to build it. And, uh, you know, the, the problem is that 
I started questioning my sanity at times because it's one thing to tell the producers, yes, I can build this for a million dollars. And the other thing is, A, can you really do it? B, are you crazy? If it doesn't work, you'll never work in the uh, business again. And I remember breaking out in a, in a rash, in an eczema, and went to see a skin specialist, and he said, take a few Valiums, because there's nothing otherwise I can do you, for you. But it needed, uh, it needed a lot of uh, conviction, and I think courage, hopefully, and great backup. It was a very complimentary team, and um, the evidence that uh, of Ken Adams' contribution is so blatant. I mean, just progressively through the films as he made them, and uh, the irony was that it, I think he insisted at one stage to be called the production designer instead of the art director, and he lost the, an Academy Award, I think. Um, in a funny way, they should have got, I think, more recognition uh, for, the, for the sets and for special effects and all sorts of things in the Bond films, and they really did. The first Bond movie I saw was Dr. No. Um, in my local cinema in a place called Belper in Derbyshire. I admire your luck, Mr... Bond. James Bond. I must have been, Mr. I don't know, about 14, 13, 14 years old, something like that. And, uh, you know, the only movies we'd seen were kind of war pictures or sort of drawing room comedies or westerns. And here was something that just was right up to date and really terrific. It was fabulous. But then, you know, that's not news. I mean, people all over the world felt exactly the same thing. And that's, that's, that's the reason why, you know, we're 30 years down the road. I remember going to one of the early screenings in Westwood. The theater manager came to me and said, Mr. Broccoli, there are two friends of mine here that would like to see the film. I don't rem remember correctly whether it was Dr. No or whether it was it was uh, Russia with Love, or Goldfinger. But he introduced me to these two chaps. One was uh, Mr. Spielberg, and the other was Mr. Lucas. And I said, certainly, and they went up and sat in our seats that we had up in this little theater in Westwood. And uh, I think that they enjoyed it. I, I don't remember hearing from them, but I know they enjoyed Bond. Well, uh, funnily enough, we did talk about it when we were doing Indiana Jones, which was a great, uh, fun experience making that film. Once we got to know each other and knew what we were doing, as it were, um, he did say that uh, he would love to have directed a Bond film, and that it, uh, it affected a great deal of his uh, childhood f uh, watching films. The Obviously, everything influences everybody, but uh, he's very inventive, uh, Spielberg, and I, I think he would have made a very interesting Bond film. And I got a phone call from Orson saying, my name is Orson Welles, I'd very much like you to have dinner with me. So I couldn't come that night, I went the next night, and before we even started dinner, Orson Welles just said straight out, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I've just seen your picture, and in a strange way, it's changed the vocabulary of the cinema. And as I said, I really didn't quite know what he meant later on. But he said something very shrewd afterwards. Orson was a very good film critic, by the way. He would have been a marvelous critic. He said, you'll find within two years, every film of this type tries to imitate this style. And he said, in the end, they'll do it better than you did. So, he's probably right.